You know, I'm a 74-year-old grandpa, and I'm on my 19th and 20th language now. Together with my son, we have developed this uh, language learning platform called Link, mm -hmm. L-I-N-G-Q. And I have a channel on YouTube with uh, almost 200,000 subscribers. So could you share some of the tips that kind of helped you learn that many languages? Well, I think the biggest thing, of course, is um, interest. Of course. Motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was 16 or 17, essentially, I just spoke English. Mm -hmm. But I had a, a professor who made French civilization, French culture very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. So then I became motivated, watched French movies, uh, read you know French newspapers, uh, and eventually went to France for three years as a as a student. I studied in French university, mm -hmm. and so it was the motivation that was the most important thing. Right. And uh, similarly, when I started working for the Canadian government, they uh, at that time the government was going to recognize the People's Republic of China, mm -hmm. so they needed to train people to speak Chinese. Wow. And so then they, uh, I volunteered, and so they sent me to Hong Kong, which of course is not a Mandarin speaking place. Right. Mm -hmm. Today there Cantonese. are Mandarin speakers there, but in the fifth, in the excuse me, in the you know late sixties, it was only Cantonese. Right. But. I was able to get enough input from listening to stuff and reading stuff and talking to my teachers that I was able to learn Mandarin. And uh, again, I, I didn't know anything about China or Chinese culture, but as you get into a language, you get interested in, you know, so many different aspects of their culture and mm -hmm. stuff. So it becomes, it becomes fun, you of know, course. so, mm -hmm. and, and I, uh, that's my approach to all the languages that I have learned. I learned them largely out of, interesting curiosity although mm -hmm. many have been very important to my to my business such as japanese for example right i've done ended up doing a lot of business in, Je in, in japan mm -hmm. and i heard you speak korean as well maybe uh, mm -hmm. it's not it's not my strongest language we can try some korean uh, i can give you a bit of a back background some sure, background sure. on my attempts at learning korean uh -huh. initial motivation and mm -hmm. the difficulties that i've found and, and uh, if you're interested. I am definitely interested. I think most of my viewers would be interested. I visited Korea in 1972. Uh-huh. So my wife and I went there, we traveled and it was very interesting. And it seemed to me that I said to myself, well, one day I should learn this language because it should be easy because I have Japanese and I have, uh, you Chinese, know, Chinese. Yes. So Korean should be, you know, <laughs> at, at least easier for me than for people who have no uh, um, you know, previous experience with yes. Asian languages. Mm -hmm. But that was that. Then I didn't do anything more. Uh, the only thing I did then was I bought a book on the history of uh, Korea, Korea. Uh -huh. written in Hanja. Oh, really? Uh, Hanja and Hangul, which I still have, which is lovely because for me, it's so much easier to read in Hanja. When I studied Chinese, I learned Chinese characters. So right. I could read the Chinese characters so I could get a, a sense of what it was about. But not a very good sense because I would miss all the hangul in between. Oh, but, right, 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 right. But, but I could at least I had the hanja. Mm -hmm. And so then uh, you know I, I've always had this interest, and uh, and then one day I decided, okay, I'm going to go for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's got to be around um, I would say six years ago. I can show you um, on on link just exactly when I studied Korean because we tracked that. Okay. Uh, let, let's just see if it works. I don't know if it's share. Actually, no, I started in 2010. Right, 2012, right. I worked at it. And then 2016, I had a 90-day challenge in Korea. Oh. And so there was intense activity there. If I look at, for example, speaking, you know, I haven't spoken since February 2016. So if I speak Korean um, today, right. this will be the first time <laughs> in four years. Right. We'll see how it goes. Mm, but yeah, most we'll of my activity was back here mm -hmm. in 2014. So here again, you'll see that my most intensive period was 2014, again in 2016, and then a little bit recently to prepare for our discussion today. So that's kind of where we stand. The biggest problem for me, there are several problems for me in Korea. Number one, the Korean dictionaries, neighbor, and I can't mm -hmm. remember the other one. I can't remember it. It's a name. I, I looked them both up. Very often, you don't get a meaningful translation. Uh, that's true. Mm -hmm. 
And I think Naver is designed for Koreans who are learning English, English. not necessarily mm-hmm. for the other way English around. speakers who are right, learning Korean. Right. So they, they give you sometimes, you know, irrelevant translations. Also, Korean has a lot of these short words, like good, good, I don't know, a bunch of them. They have nine different meanings. I'm oh, that's language, true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, you're trying to make sense of this, and there's mm-hmm. this little short word there, and you look it up, and you get nine different, totally different meanings right so that's a problem <laughs> mm-hmm. uh that so that was a problem with korean uh, uh the hangul is like any new writing system whether it be arabic writing system cyrillic for right. russian or mm-hmm. ukrainian mm-hmm. you learn it fairly quickly like what right, the letters right. mean mm-hmm. but for the brain to actually get used to it oh, and it to be able to time. read comfortably yeah. actually takes a long time yeah. so it's it's always a bit of an obstacle when you're reading in another script mm-hmm. uh, until you do enough reading that that script becomes comfortable. Right. So so reading in Hangul was a bit of a problem. Mm-hmm. The more you read, the more comfortable it becomes. Right. So mm-hmm. you read it, but you read it slowly. Mm-hmm. So reading slowly is a problem because when you're learning, reading is very important. It is. So the faster mm-hmm. you can read, the better you learn. Right. So with Hangul. I have the same problem. Like I prefer to read in Chinese. If I read in Japanese and I've got some kanji and some katagana and some hiragana, right. I find that difficult for me. I'm just, um, I, it's not that I don't understand what they're doing, but it's right, just right, my right. brain struggles doing oh. that. Whereas in, if I read Chinese, it's all kanji, it's good. Oh. Yeah, there's the odd kanji I don't know, but the odd hanja I don't know, but it's, it's more common. <laughs> anyway, mm. but a, a major problem with Korean was the lack of i would say beginner and intermediate content right i wouldn't say the mm-hmm. lack of it but the quality of it mm-hmm. um yeah i did find these podcasts like uh, there's a political podcast a liter- so there's difficult material you can find mm-hmm. but um a lot of the beginner material and i bought lots of stuff i was in korea went in a bookstore i bought stuff in japan for japanese people but the actual recorded uh, Korean, mm-hmm. very often it's e- either this very fake, cheerful, hi, everybody, how are you? Which <laughs> I don't like that stuff. I, right, I can't listen right. to it. And, and my style of listening is to listen many times, especially at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And that's why I like our mini stories. Our mini stories, oh, and the other thing, always the introductory music. Every single, Korea, except for one, introductory Korean from UBC by Ross King, which is very good. Mm-hmm. And their, their audio sounds very natural. Mm-hmm. But most of the Korean learning materials, mm-hmm. the audio does not sound natural. It's mm-hmm. not inviting. You right. don't want to listen to it more than once. Right. And, right. and it's further aggravating to hear the da 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 beginning of every lesson. So mm-hmm. you, you don't want to go back there. Again, right, because right. it's not it, the, the the audio and it has to be and the, the the listening content has to be captivating. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Kim Jong Kim Jong Bae, whatever his name was, that mm-hmm. he's good. Like he's got a nice voice. They're talking about an interesting subject, but it, it was always just a little too difficult for me. Right, right. So mm. that kind of left me. Now I have to admit that since we started our mini stories, and I, which I have used now for so many languages, for Greek, for Romanian, for Ukrainian, for Persian, for Arabic, for Turkish, and it's the same story, it doesn't matter, but there's so much repetition of common verbs, it's, it's narrated by volunteers, so mm-hmm. they're natural, authentic people, they're not actors mm-hmm. in some kind of a stylized, you know, uh, form, and I find these I'm able to listen to 10, 20, 30 times, right. and in order to get a get a uh, you know get a start in language and to get to where you can go after more difficult content, you, I find I have to listen often repeatedly to the same material, mm-hmm. not all at once necessarily, but lesson one, two, three, four, five, back to lesson one, two, three, four, five, five, six, seven, eight, back to one, and so then if I have to hear the same introductory silly music or false cheerfulness, you know, right. mm-hmm. I can't take it. I can't take it. So. That to me was a major problem. If I had, if the Korean had grabbed me, because they had good intermediate content, let's say right. something, 
with a natural voice about the history of Korea, about, mm. you know, whatever it might be, something that's of interest, that would have grabbed me and I would have gone further in Korea. Right. So that's, that's kind of my background. I see. Yeah, I think a lot of beginner contents are kind of catered to children. So that's why mm-hmm. people are trying to sound upbeat I and so. yeah, yeah, teach yeah. you unnecessary words, like mm-hmm. words that we don't really use. No. Yeah, so it's very inefficient. But it's very interesting uh, that you shared um, some of the difficulties that you face as a Korean learner. Um, oh, one other difficulty. Right, 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 right. Mm-hmm. Please. So because Korean is very similar to Japanese, mm-hmm at least in theory, the way it's structured. Uh, yeah. So my brain uh-huh. sometimes goes off into Japanese. Oh, uh, interesting. So oh. Uh, I'm trying to think of, of uh, an example. So something like temune. Mm-hmm, okay? Because of, uh-huh. Uh, hagi temune. Mm-hmm. Uh, that in, so then in Japanese, you, you would have uh, no tamini. Okay, oh, but okay. no tamini mm-hmm. is not the same as temune. Uh-huh. No tamini is all is more like we oh, so. Ah, right, right, right. For right, so right, so right. you get these things that and so and and no amount of explanation is going to tell you that. You just have to hear it often enough, and right. all of a sudden your brain That's starts true. telling you mm-hmm. no, uh, no tamini is we so. Mm-hmm. It's not temune. Uh, Mm-hmm. So, so there's all these things that sometimes, and there are sounds in Korean that are the same as in Japanese, like haru, but doesn't mean haru. Exactly, so yes, pretty. yes, yes, that's true. Oh, so mm. there are those short circuits right. that happen, you know. Uh, what does haru mean in Japanese? I forgot. Spring. Spring. Spring, oh yes, but in Korean it means a day, haru. Yeah. Right, yeah. oh, that's interesting. Um, okay, so you can speak... Um, is it fair to say you speak all three lang- East Asian languages, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, in the order of fluency? And Cantonese. And Cantonese, and, yes, of course. Yeah, and mm-hmm. the problem is sometimes I don't know if the word, because I have the, the hanja in my mind at mm-hmm. times, then I don't know if, if I'm pronouncing it in Cantonese or in Korean. But we can speak some Korean. Oh, right okay, okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> 얘기할까요? 네. 네. 아, 어, 스티브 씨 안녕하세요. 안녕하세요. 어떻게 지냈어요? 어, 저는 어, 잘 지내고 있어요. 음, 스티브 씨는요? 스티브 씨는 잘 지내고 있나요? 네, 제가 잘 지내세요. 제가 오래간만 한국어로 얘기 못못 해서 아마도 별로유정이야기아할줄아줄줄아줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄줄
그 나라의 방문의 음. 기회 할때 음. 더 많이 얘기하고요. 음, 음. 만약 음, 한국에 방문하면 음. 매일 사람들과 한국어로 얘기. <웃음> 제가 이제 음. 문제 없어요. 음. 문제 없어요. 그러기 네. 기회 없어요. 음. 기회 없어요. 혹시 한국에 몇번 아, 와봤어요? 한국에 몇번 방문해 봤어요? 네. 네. 어, have you ever been to Korea? Yeah, no, I, I didn't say it again. 어, 한국에, 한국에 몇 번? 가본, 몇 번? How many times? How many times? Yes. 어, 음. oh, how many times? 몇 번? 몇 음. 번? 에, so, 에, 7, 7, 2년, 7, 6년, 에, 8, 2, 2년, 아, 에, 음. 76년, 82년, 3년 전에 집스랑과 그 같이 베트남 베트남과 미얀마 여행하고 서울에서 how do you say some uh, two two days two days two days oh, ah yeah. 이틀 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 아 와우 Interesting. I like your choice of word of wife. You said 집사람, which is a uh, very advanced expression in Korean. That's very impressive. Okay. Yes. Right. <laughs> oh, your Korean anyway, is still very good. I'm no, very impressed. I know, but, uh, but uh, I, you know, I very much feel because I, I do have quite a large passive vocabulary. Uh huh. And right now to hear to speak with you, and you know, sometimes I didn't quite hear what you were saying. Right, so, right, right. But if I were there, if I went out in the evening with people and we were speaking Korean and stuff. You know, within a week, within a few weeks, I'm sure that they would come back. Mm -hmm. I'm a great believer in input right, and building course. up your vocabulary, mm -hmm. building up your potential, mm -hmm. and so that when you have the opportunity to speak, then you can activate that fairly quickly. Right, right, that's true. And I think in languages like Russian or Korean, grammar yeah. is a very big part of it because grammar can be quite confusing compared to other languages. Like, for example, Compared to Chinese, I think, oh, yeah. like, as a person who studied Chinese for, I guess, like, uh, less than a year, uh, mm -hmm. I felt that Chinese grammar is very simple. It's not that it's easy, but it's right. quite simple, and it's easy to uh, kind of, I don't know, yeah. process it. Yeah. But you know what? I never look at it in that way. Right, right, right. Um, I, uh, I had this book put out by University of British Columbia here, Ross King, mm -hmm. it's called Intermediate Korean. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of explanations and lots of fancy grammar terms. And I didn't really know what they were talking about. Of course. And mm -hmm. okay, in Korean, the words change. Okay. Whereas in Chinese, they don't change. Mm -hmm. However, in any language, there are patterns. Mm -hmm. So there are patterns in Korean. Mm -hmm. This is how we say this in Korean. This is how we say it in Japanese. This is how we say it in Chinese or in French or whatever. And to me, the process of learning is, is a matter of seeing as many examples as possible of the different patterns in mm -hmm. a language. Mm -hmm. and, and you initially, you equate it to sort of meaning in English. And as you hear that pattern often enough, then you really get a sense of how that pattern is used. So when I studied Korean, I don't read the grammatical explanations. Mm -hmm. uh, the only good thing is that very often if they have a quiz, which I typically I avoid any drills or quiz quizzes, I only deal with examples. And this intermediate Korean at a University of British Columbia, they had lots of examples and then they recorded them. So you hear the examples. Uh, or if there were drills or questions, I would just go to the answers because mm -hmm. typically the answers would again be the sort of a concentration of examples. So I don't operate, whether it be Russian or any other language, yeah, you got to kind of read it. I read the grammar not because I think I'm going to remember anything, but it kind of helps, helps me notice certain things. But ultimately, I have to get used to the patterns of the language. That's how I learned Chinese, that's how I learned Japanese, Korean, to the extent that I speak it, you know. 
So mm-hmm. I, 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 uh, I don't really see it as a grammar thing. I see it as a, a patterns. And that's again, why the mini stories are so good because you're basically in a, we have 60 mini stories. So you're going to meet the same structure five times in each mini story, the same structures, a lot of high frequency verbs, and mm-hmm. a lot of the same structures because you tell the story once from one point of view, then you tell the story from another point of view, then you ask a question, but but you immediately provide the answer. Uh, so you're not left scratching your head trying to remember what was in the story. You've just given concentrated exposure to the same words and structures. And if you repeat that often enough, the brain starts to get a sense of how those structures work to express meaning. And that is, to me, um, an easier process than trying to apply rules. For example, in right. Chinese, okay, the grammar is simpler, but there are still patterns. Yes. So in, you know, ni chi bu chi, that's a pattern. But... I don't need a, a <laughs> grammatical explanation, but that's how they say, are you going, ni chi bu chi. Ni chi bu chi. Uh, mm-hmm. If, uh, you know, zhou suan ni bu xi wan ta, ta hai shi, uh, the group or whatever it might be. So, mm-hmm. so those are just patterns and there's lots of patterns. Mm-hmm. I don't know. There, it's not an unlimited number, but there might be 50, 70, 80 patterns. And if you're used to those patterns, you basically got the language covered. And that is more useful than the complicated uh, grammatical explanations, grammatical terms, right. you know, I teach both children and I teach adults, uh, okay. English, I mean, uh, and I take different approaches because different approaches work for each individual. And I think, sure for, ch- and I think for children, the repetition really works, um, mm-hmm. like giving them phrases and not really giving them further explanation on it, but then they're mm-hmm. really good at using them again in their own, in their own context. Right. So that's very impressive. But when it comes to adult learners, um, I'm not saying like they're worse learners than children. It's just that mm-hmm. they get used to, they get used to, uh, how do you say? Like they're more curious, I guess, mm-hmm. in a sense. They want, I don't know, they're more interested in science or more interested in explanation. Uh, so I guess it's pretty inevitable for as a teacher to kind of uh, explain about the rules like why it works that way and give them mm-hmm. detailed explanation on how different this expression can be used in different context um, mm-hmm. and they learn better by it not just okay mm. what I find is that repetitive listening and reading right at an early stage is very very effective. And when you are curious about a grammar point, absolutely, you want to ask the teacher or you want to look it up or whatever, but most of the activity, and the great thing about listening is that you can really do it anywhere, anytime, so Mm -hmm. there's easily an hour a day to find uh, preparing breakfast, uh, cleaning up uh, after dinner, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, in on the train, in the car. Right, right. So that's kind of my approach. I I tend to focus more on on what I can get in me. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't normally engage with a tutor until I have had a lot of input. You need to first because have Because I don't understand very well what the tutor is saying. I don't have any words. I can't say anything. And so we end up with a very limited range of vocabulary in our mm-hmm. exchange. Whereas if I can build up my passive vocabulary, build up my comprehension, then when I engage with the tutor, we can actually talk about some things that are interesting. So then you actually have a meaningful conversation. All right. And that's in a way where the way Link was developed is, is very much based on Stephen Krashen's ideas and, um, of, of, you know, the input method and, uh, and, and particularly now the sort of circling questions, which I think is a great technique. So that the circling questions, all they do is like, if, if the story said Steve went to the store, he bought a, you know, a shirt or something. So then the question says, Steve went to the store. That's a statement. Mm -hmm. Followed immediately by the question, did Steve go to a restaurant? And then the answer comes right away. No, Steve didn't go to a restaurant. He went to the store. And that is, you hear the recording and you read it. So in that, that particular sentence would have appeared once in the, twice in the story, Mm -hmm. because Steve goes to the store and then Steve went to the store or Steve goes to the store and then I went to the store. So a few things change, 
And then you have these questions, so the same, these circling questions. So the same structure and the same vocabulary repeats five times in this story. And, I, and you can imagine, I will listen to that story before I'm done 30 or 40 times. Say for Arabic or Persian, when I start out, everything is just noise, I don't understand anything. <laughs> And by the time I listen to it for the 20th or 30th time, and I've read it for the 5th or 6th or 7th time, and I've looked up all the words in the online dictionary, and I've saved them, and I've reviewed them, all of a sudden, it's meaning. Mm. And if I'm curious about grammar, I have a book. I look it up. Mm -hmm. Or if I have a teacher, I ask the teacher. But, but uh, that's when I'm curious. But mostly, I'm just exposing myself to the language. Right. I actually try to... Um, kind of brush up on my Chinese for I, I think oh, yeah. I think for two days and I failed okay. because it doesn't work. It's language learning is not a two day process, right? No, 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 um, no, no, no. It's a permanent ongoing <laughs> yes, process. Yes. Although I saw a video of yours where you spoke Chinese and I mm -hmm. thought you spoke very well and you have very good pronunciation. Uh uh Chinese ability is is not good. It's really not okay. good. <laughs> but you know what? You should you should get on on link. We'll give you a, a, a free membership. You should go do the mini stories in Chinese. You'd oh. be amazed how that revives. The mini stories are different from real content. So, so the real content, you know, you got to get into something that's interesting about whatever subjects are of interest to you in Chinese at some point. That, but that. if you do the mini stories. At whatever stage, like I, my, I, in Korea now, I have a big vocabulary, but I go back to the mini stories because it's like going to the gym. It's training. It gets the brain into the patterns of the language. Right. And your Chinese is probably much better than you think. You're just a bit rusty. And I would recommend you try the mini stories in Chinese. Mm. And uh, you, you'd be surprised because you basically you have it. I hear you expressing uh, concepts in Chinese uh, perfectly correctly with good pronunciation. So I don't believe your Chinese is not that uh, it's not good. It's because it's because it was easy phrases. Yeah, so okay, that's... but you gotta have easy phrases. I mean, <laughs> the, the, to me, I also believe that you know our passive vocabulary is very important because mm. we have to understand what people are saying. But oh, yeah, when that's we speak, mm. we're gonna use a much smaller subset of that. Mm. That's yeah, true. That's yeah. fine, and we communicate, and then the other person says something that's richer in vocabulary, and we right, pick up right. on that. Mm -hmm. So that's the process. I think uh, some people uh, consider language learning as kind of a hobby, not really to like communicate with other people, but something they do uh -huh. because they want to uh, not kill their time, but they want to use their time more effectively. So mm -hmm. that's why people kind of kind of go into books and uh, I don't know, might maybe watch dramas or movies in that language. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah, I think that's a pretty good approach because uh, when you want to keep it up, when you want to keep up the language, you kind of have to have that interest and you have to feel the fun, right? You have to have that right. emotional emotional connection and with the language. That's right. And, right. and what happens is, is uh, so if, if, particularly if you have a lot of languages, I can't be speaking to people in all these languages all the right, time. Right, 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 right. But... Every little bit that you engage with that language, and if it's Korean drama or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. or I listen to a podcast, right. you get a, a deeper and deeper understanding of those people. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a it's a way of discovering these different cultures. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's very valuable. And then when you do have the opportunity to speak, if you've built up this comprehension, you're going to improve your speaking pretty quickly. Right. So I think that's a, 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 I'm a great believer in, in, you know, if you're not in the country, well, obviously if I'm in Korea, I'm going to speak in, be speaking Korean to everybody I meet. Right. But if I'm back home and I don't have the opportunity, I, you don't have as much I'm not chance. necessarily, if I go to a Korean restaurant, I might speak to the waiter. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go out and look for people necessarily. Right, right. 
Mm-hmm. If I see someone who I think is Korean, I'll speak to them in Korean. Mm-hmm. I do that all the time. Right, I, right, right. It's fun, you know. They're surprised. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your Korean is so good. 한국어 진짜 It's 잘한다. Not... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's that's the fun of it. I think there's maybe not like I, I used to be quite. I don't know. Like uh, because I learned English at such a at such a young age, mm-hmm. I always thought that. Everybody should learn English the way I did, but right. then there are many people who are learning new languages after they became of age, and so mm-hmm. you know, I, I guess like any approach or any method can work if they feel the fun and if they feel the joy out of it. So absolutely, so yeah, that's kind of my philosophy. <laughs> yeah, and, and I don't think age matters. You know exactly. Uh, like, look at you. You're the living example. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's so impressive. Uh, most of my languages, I learned them as, as an adult. So right, it, right. It's all a matter of attitude, as you exactly, say. You've got to yeah. have fun with it. Right. And whatever system you use, believe in it. Right. Believe that what you're doing is worthwhile. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is, it's, it's so rich. Like right now, learning Arabic and Persian, I'm learning so much more. I have a, such a different understanding of those people. Right. Just by having a little, however, you know, imperfect my knowledge of Persian and Arabic is, mm-hmm. I, I have a better feel for those people. And mm-hmm. so to get to know different people, different cultures around the world is, is a lot of fun. It's, mm-hmm. it's great. That's true, yeah. And I think... Yeah. Consistency is the most important to kind of keep it up. Absolutely. Right. And in that regard, English is the best second language to learn because English is obviously spoken worldwide. So right. you're never going to stop learning, right? You're never going right. to stop using it. So. And, and there's an abundance of materials. Material, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Now the situation for Korean has improved. If I were learning Korean, I would bring stuff from Netflix in the link. Oh yeah, because there's so mm-hmm. many good series on Netflix. But mm-hmm. unfortunately, right now I'm I'm committed to learning Arabic and Persian. Otherwise, I'd go after some Korean, you know, drama on Netflix. And you can actually <laughs> import the uh, the subtitles. Oh uh, really? And, and study the, the, oh. the dialogue so that you have a better chance of right, understanding. Right, right, right. Oh, you have to pay for the subtitles on on Netflix. Is that how it works? No, uh, no, I don't think so. I was mm. doing it for Turkish for a while. I can't remember what I did. Maybe I, maybe there, maybe I used some kind of third party. Um, no, I think what we were able to. I think we have a, uh, we have a uh, browser extension actually for Link. Mm-hmm. We can get the video into the lesson, and we can get the the. Uh, The subtitles in as text, mm-hmm. but they wouldn't let us have the sound. I think that was mm-hmm. I, there was some problem. I can't remember. Right. But but I was uh, yeah, I was using uh, using it for Turkish. Mm. Oh, I could do it for. I haven't done it recently, so I can't. It's too difficult for me for Turkish. The Turkish right, right. series. So, um, if you don't mind, uh, can we hear you speaking in Arabic? Even just a few short phrases. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Ana, eh, eh, Ana, Ana means I Alan, am, right? Ana, 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 Uh, wow. Okay. Wow, your your accent is really good. <laughs> like I know that <laughs> accent in Arabic. Uh-huh. And you can you can imitate that quite accurately. Wow. Yeah. I'm uh, of course focused right now on standard Arabic. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I were to visit, you know, Lebanon or Egypt, and right, I'd right, probably right. try to learn the local mm-hmm. version. Mm-hmm. Persian is Persian. a lot easier than Arabic. There are a whole bunch of languages starting right. from, you know, the Western European language right through to Hindi, mm-hmm. Urdu, mm-hmm. Persian. They're all part of a one big family of languages, so the structure is easier. Mm. Arabic is more different. Right. So, so is Turkish. I thought Persian and Arabic share the same root, but... 
not at all. Mm-hmm. They share 15% and 50, I don't know what the number is, mm-hmm. uh, of vocabulary. Turkish, Arabic, and Persian share 10, 15% of vocabulary. Mm-hmm. But structurally, they're all different. different. Turkish, oh. if anything, is a little bit closer to Korean Japanese. Oh, yes, I think, I think I've heard of that somewhere, yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah. I used to have many Arabic friends, like Arab friends, oh, yeah. right? So oh, yeah. I used to know a couple of words, but now I forgot all of them. But I know, <sighs> yalla, yalla. Yalla, yalla, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. And Habibi, Habibti. Habibi and Habibti, it's like, Habibi is like calling someone who's male, kind of, you know, kind of my dear. It's, dear, a, it's yeah, an yeah, yeah. affectionate term. Yeah. yeah, Habibi, Habibti. And that's all I know. <laughs> yeah, well, but it's, a it's good interesting. Start. Yeah. One thing that is interesting is, mm. you know, we talked about how learning a language is an introduction to the culture. Right. And the sort of underpinning of mm-hmm. Asian, East Asian languages is Chinese culture. Right. Mm-hmm. Even though, of course, Korean and Japanese are structurally kind of similar, but not the same. Mm-hmm. And of course, Chinese is quite different. Mm-hmm. But it is fun. To, I think it's a great pity that in Korea, they don't use Chinese characters. We, we do. We do, actually. Oh, you do? You yes. Don't, I mean... You even have Chinese origin words, right, right. Oh, but in right. all the texts that I see, I have to guess what the hunter oh, is. Oh, right, 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 right. Oh. Now, I can yeah. go to my neighbor Hanja dictionary and look up the uh, Hanja mm-hmm. when it's available. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I save words at length, uh, I go to the neighbor Hanja dictionary and I copy the Hanja mm-hmm. into the, you know, the definition that I keep. Mm-hmm. in uh, in links so that anyone who comes behind me will see the hanja there right it's very right. helpful mm. but i i think the hanja are wonderful it and, is and uh, mm. yeah but i think if you know hanja it will be a lot easier for you to get used to korean vocabularies oh, yeah. yeah absolutely mm-hmm. big advantage yes big advantage. and even japanese as well right because they use yep. a little bit of kanji that they comes use, from Hanta. I would say Koreans use more. If we could actually mm. see them, right, right, right. there would be more oh, Hanja in Korea uh-huh, than in Japanese. Uh-huh. In Japanese, about 50%. I suspect in Korea, it's more like 60 years. Yes, yes. A lot of words come from Chi- Chinese words. Like right. Sino, we call them Sino Korean words. Right. Mm. Korean is influenced by many, many languages. Like we have a lot of Congress words. A lot of which words? Co- co- uh, we call it Congress, the mixture of Korean and English. So okay. in English, it doesn't okay. really make sense, but in Korea, we speak it like that. For example, we say speaker, speaker to say speaker. <laughs> okay, yeah, right. yeah, no, there's lots of those. Yeah, uh, like chocolate, it's chocolate. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there are many words like that. <laughs> mm-hmm. mm. So as a, as a person like yourself, we speak both Chinese and English. I think learning Korean, picking up on Korean again would you know, be a lot easier to you. Mm. Yeah, I think those English words, there's not that many of them actually though. Oh. <laughs> but when you come mm-hmm. across them, you you know what they mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So tell me, the people who are learning Korean mm-hmm. with your, uh, at your channel, what, what are their reasons? What are their motivations? What's, what's the, their main purpose? Of oh, actually there are many, there are many. A lot of people, I assume, mm-hmm. um, get into learning Korean because of K-pop, which I thought at first was a silly, you know, silly reason, but right. actually it's not because if it makes you feel, you know, fun and love to the language, sure. then whatever it is, it works, right? So you can, exactly. yeah, you can exactly. use that. Interest, you can take advantage sure. of that to keep it up. Yeah. So, yeah. so yes, for whatever reason they're learning Korean, I'm really thankful <laughs> to people <laughs> exactly. like you, like you. Yeah, it's like you. Them. They experience a different culture. Right. Of so, course. So... Thank you for learning Korean, and I hope you can pick up Korean again. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah. Mm. Yes. No, it's fun. It's fun, and Koreans are, in most cases, very appreciative if you speak to them in Korean. Yes. Quite surprised. Right, right, right. Because we used to be, yeah, we, we used to be, we still are, but we used to be very unrecognized. We're a very small country with small power, so that's why we find it very. 
exciting and impressive that other people would even take interest in Korean language? Yeah, yeah. Korean, Korea is not so small. I mean, depends on, if you look at the top 10, like, it may not be in the top 10, but it's not far. Like, if I don't know whether it's 40 or 50 million people in South Korea and another 20 or so in the North, that's 70 million people. You know, you're right up there. There's 90 million Vietnamese, 125 million Japanese, 60 million, you know, Italians, German, French, whatever. I mean, it's a major country. A major country economically, uh, and now, um, now uh, culturally, a lot of people are interested in things Korean. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, mm. absolutely. Thank you for <laughs> allowing me onto your channel, and I hope that your uh, listeners enjoy this and that of they uh, continue to learn Korean and that you continue to help them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much okay. for offering to being on my channel. And All right. I'm sure that your, your your advice and your tips help a lot of my viewers and... I hope so. I mean, as you said, it depends what people like to do. And right, right, right. Uh, people, obviously, it has to be fun for people. Mm -hmm. And to so to that extent, people have different tastes. Mm -hmm. All I can do is share my experience right, and, right. and what I do to learn. And if that's helpful to people, that's fine. To me, language learning is all about your attitude. Right, right. And time. Mm -hmm. So you have to find the time. Right, right. Consistency. And attitude. You like mm -hmm. it, you want to do it, you like the language, you, mm -hmm. you've got to believe in yourself. Definitely. So if you have a positive attitude and you spend enough time, you will learn. Right. That's it. Mm -hmm. You will learn. And I'm, I'm sure you're able to encourage and, and uh, your learners and get them motivated and uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure they do well. I hope so too. <laughs>